And now, the Everfree Network presents A Shower of Stars by Cardwin. Read for you by Dusty Cat. With Meredith Sims, Ellie Loopster, Rev, Hannah May, Jen McGregor, and Tay. Music by Cardwin. Produced by Rob Bob and edited by One Trick. Chapter 3 Satori Beyond the path of the outmost sun, through utter darkness hurled, further than ever comet flared or vagrant star dust swirled, lived such as fought, and sailed, and ruled, and loved, and made our world. Rudyard Kipling The room at the top of the off-limits tower was unlike any that Twilight or Rainbow Dash had ever seen. A large circular floor inlaid with several types of luxurious wood, in the same stylized sunburst that Celestia bore on her haunch, dominated the room. It was sunken into a recess, and a circular table surrounded it completely with the exception of two walkways. On the wall beyond the tables, high-quality maps framed as if they were art hung on the walls. The somewhat harsh lighting came from an array of overhead spotlights, with the brightest illuminating the central floor. This place, which Celestia described as the incident room, had a deadly serious feeling to it. Twilight would have liked to study the maps, particularly the ones with lands neighboring Equestria, but there was no time for that. She and Rainbow Dash were escorted by unicorn guards to places at the surrounding table. There were others in attendance, the Wonderbolt's leader, whom everyone simply called Captain, also stood at the table, as did the commander of the Royal Guard, the chief archivist, the headmaster of Celestia's school for gifted unicorns, and several ponies that Twilight knew only by sight, some of whom stood at the tables, some of whom were standing by the walls with the rank-and-file Wonderbolts and mid-level guard officers. Nimbus, now in her Wonderbolt flight suit, waited behind Twilight and Rainbow Dash, her presence somehow comforting them. Celestia and Luna stood upon the central floor, Speaking very quietly to each other, as the last of the attendees entered and the doors were closed, Celestia wrapped a golden shod hoof on the floor. Conversation ceased immediately. Friends, thank you for your attendance on such short notice. She began. All bowed their heads. There is little time to waste, so I will keep the formalities to a minimum. Though not all of you have met each other, it is enough to know that you are all defenders of the land of Equestria and have in the past put yourself at risk for its good. Tonight, I must ask you to do so again. There was an intensity and aura of command about Celestia, which neither Twilight nor Rainbow Dash had ever experienced. This was not the gentle, motherly ruler of Equestria. This was royalty in its most meaningful sense. A threat approaches from the night sky, the princess continued. Some of you may have heard or guessed something of it already. The falling stars which you may have seen tonight are its harbingers. Please lend an ear to Princess Luna. She can explain better than I. Luna stepped forward. For a moment, she hung her head. Her eyes lifted and met Twilight's just for a moment. Luna took a deep breath, then stood straight. When she spoke, her voice had an older, otherworldly timbre. Even the very words she chose belied her young appearance. Do you remember the ancient tales? The star shall aid her escape. The thing that I was, Nightmare Moon, did escape. None are gladder than I am that she was defeated. Yet her schemes, my schemes, I am ashamed to say, did not disappear with her. She set some of the stars themselves against Equestria. If she could not rule, she would at least have vengeance. There was a chill silence. Some of the attendees looked upon Luna with pity, some with fear, and some with open loathing. Celestia again tapped a hoof, an expression of stern disapproval on her face as she wordlessly reminded all that this was her sister, the Princess Luna, not the creature Nightmare Moon. Luna glanced at Celestia, who nodded. Show them, Celestia said. Luna closed her eyes and spread her wings. The light seemed to recede, and the wisps of stardust night flowed from her mane and tail, filling the room like a fog. As the gathered ponies watched nervously, a ghostly outline of Luna seemed to grow from her, becoming slimmer and taller 
until it stood as tall as Celestia. There were whispers of nightmare, but these were hushed as the outline became more distinct. This was not Nightmare Moon, but the regal princess of the stars, equal to the sun princess. What Luna might have been, had there been not a thousand years of timeless exile and heartless rage. The dark mist around the ponies dissipated. They were all standing on nothingness, surrounded on all sides, above and below, by a sky darker than an equestrian night, and stars more brilliant than any diamond. There was no sign of the furnishings, the walls, the floor, anything of the room which they had been in. Though the ponies' hooves still felt something underfoot, several of the Pegasus ponies present reflexively flapped their wings, though doing so only set them hovering in place. In the midst, Celestia and the regal ghost Luna stood. The post-adolescent Luna, whom they knew, was not to be found. Luna gestured with a wing. There they are, she said in a breathy, ethereal voice. The Revenge of Nightmare Moon. All turned to look where she had indicated. Three luminous star-like objects, the same which Twilight and Rainbow Dash had seen in the telescope earlier, were moving steadily toward a blue-green disk. Along their path, both preceding and trailing the bright specks, were the lesser sparks. Some had almost reached the disk. These are the spirits of wrathful stars, given form. I had hoped they would have disappeared when Nightmare Moon was defeated, but it seems they have a life of their own now. They are not normal, natural meteors, which by the power of Celestia do not reach the land. The borders will not stop them, for they are sent by a princess of Equestria. Luna's voice took on a note of profound sadness. Yet I cannot recall or divert them, for Nightmare Moon is gone. It is by her will that they strike, not mine. And when they have passed through the border veil, though they will have been slowed, they will become cold, real stone. They will strike, and they will destroy. Luna paused, then recited in a spell-like litany. Manhattan, for its indifferent, self-absorbed thousands. Ponyville, for its laughter that seemed mockery. And Canterlot. She turned to face Celestia. For you. Nobody spoke for long moments. Celestia spread her wings, and with the slightest of wing beats moved to Luna. She rested her head on Luna's shoulder, Luna doing the same on Celestia's shoulder, and they touched golden shod to silver shod forehooves. It was somehow reassuring that even in a council of war, the princesses were unashamed to show affection and forgiveness for each other. Luna moved her wings and separated from Celestia. I have been afraid to reach too deeply into her memories. If I had done so sooner, perhaps I would have known- There was a sudden concussive boom which struck them all. The surrounding spacescape rippled, then seemed to collapse into itself. The shock of transition back to the chamber was dizzying. Some along the wall retched. As the ponies came to their senses, they saw that the doorway to the chamber balcony had been blasted open, and a flinty, burnt smell filled the room. Several ponies staggered over the balcony to look upon the plaza below, Twilight and Rainbow Dash among them. There was a smoking pit ten feet across in the middle of the patio of the restaurant at which Twilight, Rainbow Dash, and Celestia had eaten not two hours earlier. Glowing red crystals lined the pit. A few more were scattered across the plaza. Several ponies were limping away from the small crater, bleeding from shrapnel cuts. Others were running or flying about aimlessly. Some were screaming in terror. One with a broken leg and a gash on his side that showed the white of a rib bone and the scarlet of a crystalline shard was being dragged by his tail away from the scene. It was the waiter who had served them their desserts. Twilight's stomach threatened to spasm. She had never seen such appalling injuries before. However, even as they watched, the royal guards were arriving at the scene, calming the crowd and making way for the evacuation of the seriously hurt. As Twilight had told Rainbow Dash earlier, the guards were professionals. There was comfort in that. Spitfire and a Pegasus guard whom Rainbow Dash recognized as Lieutenant Cloudmane spoke quickly with the guard commander then flew down to the plaza below. The rest of the ponies returned their attention to the two princesses in the center of the room. Luna, now back in her familiar youthful appearance, had collapsed and was being gently nuzzled by Celestia. After a moment, Luna struggled to her feet, the effort of becoming the star princess showing. I'm okay. I just need a moment. She whispered to Celestia. Celestia turned to face the other ponies. We have no time for elaborate plans, she said firmly. We will have to simply do what we can. She regarded Luna for a moment, then held each of the other ponies in her gaze, one after the other, taking their measure. I will go to Manhattan, 
she said at length. I will take the Royal Guard Pegasus ponies with me. Princess Luna will remain here at Canterlot, and with the unicorns of the guard and the elder magi, she indicated to the school headmistress and the chief archivist, she will lead its defense. Luna looked startled, but Celestia continued. She knows more of the nature of this threat than any of us. If any pony can find a way to save lives, she can. The guards who remain here will be under her command. Celestia then turned to face the blue uniformed flyers. The Wonderbolts, along with Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash, and their friends, will protect Ponyville. Rainbow Dash made a fearful eep, and Twilight opened her mouth to object. Celestia smiled and raised a hoof for stalling objections. The greatest flyers of Equestria, and the elements of harmony. Together, you are equal to the task. In unison, Celestia and Luna lowered their horns to the assembly. Every pony bowed deeply in return. There is no time to lose. Go now, with the blessings of Equestria upon you. With that, Celestia nodded to the Pegasus guards, and they stepped onto the balcony and took wing. Luna took a deep breath, then turned to the cluster of unicorns. Let's go, she said. I have a few ideas. And led them out to the spiraling stairway. The Wonderbolts gathered around Rainbow Dash and Twilight. Nimbus approached Rainbow Dash, a broad smile on her face. Looks like we get to fly together, sooner than I thought. Good thing you're used to being a hero. The tension in Rainbow Dash burst all at once, and she laughed. Yeah, no pressure. Now let's go save Ponyville! As the Wonderbolts moved to the balcony to take off, Twilight asked in a meek voice, Could one of you give me a lift? My chariot is... Um, out of order. Chapter 4. The Star of the Show If any star shed peace, tis thou that sendest it from above. Thomas Campbell The night was eerily quiet as the flight of ponies made its way toward Ponyville. Ten blue-suited Pegasus ponies, one rainbow-maned flyer, and a chariot pulled by two royal guards bearing a scared purple unicorn made for quite a sight. Rainbow Dash was in a subdued mood, keyed up but not talkative. She couldn't stop staring at the marker-light-equipped steel boots she had been issued. They were simplified, brightly polished versions of the shin-guarding boots which the princesses wore. Or was it the other way around, that the royal shoes were ornate versions of these? Rainbow Dash mentally replayed the words Nimbus had spoken as she had brought her the boots and buckled them on. The Wonderbolts are going to battle. You'll need these. As they approached the market square of Ponyville, they could see that the trouble had already begun. Ponies were gathered, milling around, and at least two buildings had been hit and were on fire. Here and there, red crystal fragments, the shattered remains of the fallen stars, reflected and refracted the light of the flames. One of the Wonderbolts zipped ahead, calling, Make way! Clearing a section of the plaza for the chariot to land. Even as the chariot touched down, another pair of meteor crystals streaked downwards. Spitfire surged upwards with uncanny acceleration, looped to parallel the shard, and bucked it as she passed. The shard veered off to one side to impact in an empty field on the outskirts of town. The other was dealt with by Sorn in a similar manner, though he couldn't turn as tightly as Spitfire or match the speeds of the meteor until it was closer to the ground. His kick was much stronger and actually shattered the crystal. Twilight jumped out of the chariot before it had even come to a halt. The mayor of Ponyville ran up to her, accompanied by several of Ponyville's leading citizens. Twilight and Captain were soon in hurried conversation with the town elders, leaving Rainbow Dash to fidget uncertainly. Nimbus drew Rainbow Dash aside. They're going to be talking evacuation, and what can be done on the ground to help with the fence? Yeah, maybe I can help, said Rainbow Dash, as she started towards Twilight. Nimbus put a wing out to check Rainbow Dash. Let them worry about that. Nimbus said. She indicated the sky with a lift of her head. Our problem is up there. We have to play our zone and trust them to handle theirs. Nimbus tickled Rainbow Dash's face with a wing, then leapt into the air. Rainbow Dash sneezed, then followed, catching up quickly. Nimbus looked over at Rainbow Dash, grinning widely. She got an eloquent <laughs> in return. So you think you can keep up with the Wonderbolts, do you? Nimbus taunted. Let's see if you have what it takes. We're in for a long night. You're with me. Stay close. We work in pairs. When in doubt, come up on my right wing. And watch my back. I'll be watching yours. She gave Rainbow Dash a salute, received one in return, 
and began a figure eight patrol a few hundred feet above the town. Below them, the crowd had become more orderly. Groups had formed, and a steady line of ponies was headed southwards, fillies and colts escorted by adults. Rainbow Dash recognized the distinctive yellow and pink of Fluttershy, and there was no mistaking the hyperkinetic bouncing of Pinkie Pie as she moved from child to child. Rainbow Dash smiled to herself. Leave it to Pinkie to turn an evacuation into a game. The foals wouldn't be frightened with Pinkie there. As they worked their patrol, Canelot was visible from time to time. The red meteor streaks were making it nearly to the ground before slowing to a halt then winking out. Occasional parts of Canelot were obscured by what seemed to be a dark cloud that was itself full of stars. The meteors vanished as they touched the cloud. Whatever it was that Princess Luna and the Unicorn Mage guards were doing was as disturbing as it was effective. Seeing how low the falling stars were getting before being dealt with in Canelot worried Rainbow Dash. She asked, Uh, shouldn't we be higher up with the others? She looked overhead and saw pairs of ponies high above spiraling up, then diving to parallel incoming red streaks. The ponies' marker lights would converge with the falling stars, then the falling stars would veer away from town. We'll get our turn, said Nimbus. You can't stay long in air that thin and that high up, and you're working hard. We rotate who's on high watch, and while we're down here, we... Nimbus suddenly banked hard left and dived. Surprised, Rainbow Dash followed a moment later. A falling star shard a couple of feet across streaked past them at a shallow angle, heading straight for Twilight's tree library. Nimbus was ready for it, though, and as it passed her, she gave a hard buck. The shard was deflected upwards, missed the library perhaps twenty feet, and continued beyond the edge of town where it gouged a deep furrow in the carrot patch. Nimbus extended her wings and pulled back up. We watch for anything that gets through, she concluded, and we don't let it hit anything breakable. Nimbus had a bit of a smug look to her. Rainbow Dash noticed, though, that sparks were trailing from Nimbus's hind hooves for several seconds after the buck. It was a good thing those boots were tough. And heat-resistant. Rainbow Dash had little time to consider, though, as three more low-angle shards came in. She put on a burst of speed, leaving a multicolored trail behind her. She passed underneath one of the shards, rolled to inverted, and bucked upwards as she passed below. Then finished the roll as she overtook another shard. This one she kicked to the left. Both shards missed buildings, one cratering an alley behind Sugar Cube Corner, the other barely missing the clock tower as it sailed out of sight to land steaming in the pond. Turning back, Rainbow Dash saw that Nimbus had taken care of the third shard. It had needed three kicks to guide it past the town hall, and had crashed into a hillside just outside of town. Not bad, Nimbus called out as Rainbow Dash came alongside. That's how we do it in Ponyville! Rainbow Dash grinned at Nimbus, but the grin faded as she looked down. A third building had caught fire, set alight by the already burning home next to it. The flames were threatening to get out of control. Maybe we ought to bring in the weather ponies to rain out the fires, Rainbow Dash said. I could go to Cloudsdale and... Nimbus shook her head. That would take too long, and if there were clouds, we wouldn't be able to see the incoming falling stars until it's too late. And that's assuming the weather ponies don't have problems of their own. She banked about and pointed her hoof downwards. Your friends have it covered. Down below, a large group of ponies were galloping to Ponyville, from the direction of the apple orchards to the west. Some pulling violently lurching carts and wagons filled with barrels and pails. At the head of the group was a distinctive blonde-haired orange pony. The newcomers moved to one bank of the stream running through the town and set up a line. The lead pony ran back and forth, giving directions, and within moments two bucket brigades were relaying water to the fires. The ponies of Sweet Apple Acres had seen their neighbors in distress and responded in force. Rainbow Dash let out a cheer. Go Applejack! You rock! Nimbus smiled, then pulled up the hover as the two panning wonder bolts flew down. One had a scorch mark on his flight suit. Both had soot on their hoof boots. High watch, Lieutenant, panted one of them. Nimbus saluted. Yes, sir! She looked over her shoulder to see that Rainbow Dash was following, then began the long climb. Overhead, the incoming starfall was intensifying, and the brilliant central star shard was almost as bright enough to cast shadows. Pairs of Wonderbolts looped and banked, and wherever they came into contact with a glowing red streak, the streak was deflected. Not all of the shards were intercepted, and it seemed to Rainbow Dash that the shards were also becoming larger. Still, they climbed, until breathing became difficult. The other Wonderbolts were below them, and as Nimbus and Rainbow Dash took their station, they could see that the defense had come down to ground level. Splashes of light from the town square showed unicorn magic of some sort at work. They had no time to wonder what those on the ground were doing, however. 
a swarm of several dozen shards suddenly blazed past, and two Pegasus ponies dived down after. Nimbus began dodging among the shards, giving each a modest kick as she passed. At first Rainbow Dash was puzzled as to why Nimbus was not bucking as hard as she could, but then she remembered, at this altitude, small deflections wouldn't be enough to make the shards miss the town. Nimbus was also right about conserving their energy. Just keeping a loft this high up was making them both gasp for air. This was a kind of flying which Rainbow Dash had thoroughly mastered, however. Nobody beat Dash at aerial dodgeball. Rainbow Dash began making quick, graceful arcs through the swarm, leaving her glowing spectrum trail behind her. Each arc brought her within range of several of the shards, and she rolled and banked to kick at the shards as she overtook them. Forehoof, hindhoof, left, right. All four steel-shod feet were in action. She looped up, then behind, then dived down for another pass, and another and another, twisting to strike in almost a dance-like rhythm. Nimbus, seeing the situation being handled, pulled up and began working at the swarm's trailing members. They had almost reached the altitude of the next flight of Wonderbolts, when Nimbus called for a return to station. Though there were a few shards still in a deadly course, the others would handle them. Both ponies pulled up, turning their momentum into regained altitude as far as they could before resuming their wing beats to climb. Nimbus was about to compliment Rainbow Dash on the skill of her flight, but hesitated as she saw the look of pain on Rainbow Dash's face. The reason was obvious. Her hoof boots were smoking, the steel discolored to a blue-tinged straw color on their edges. Nimbus's own boots were uncomfortably warm, and Rainbow Dash had deflected many more. Are you okay? Nimbus called. No bravado, I need to know. Rainbow Dash held her legs downward, where the most airflow could get to them and cool the boots. It's kinda hot, but I'll be okay. How'd we do? Nimbus grinned. Not bad for a beginner. No, really, that was amazing. Only the darkness of the night sky hid Rainbow Dash's blush. Blistered hooves stood no chance against a compliment from a Wonderbolt. Rainbow Dash did a little victory roll, then formed up smartly on Nimbus's right wingtip, feathers almost touching. The celebration was short-lived, though. From below, the pair saw the other Wonderbolts climbing urgently towards them. A glance upward showed why. The main star shard, nearly as bright as a full moon, was almost upon them. Warm-up's over, said Nimbus quietly. She could not hide the nervousness in her voice. Time for the main event.